But if you would take your Bible and turn with me to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. And if you don't have a Bible, just raise your hand and we have some extra copies in the back. We'd love to get one in your hands. We'd like you to follow along. Okay, right up here, Brother Troy. And uh, right back there. So right up here. Good deal. Over here as well, uh, Brother Jerry. Great. All right, Troy. Good deal. Well, we want you to follow along as we study God's Word together. And uh, we'll pick up the reading at the top of the chapter. Romans chapter 6, verse 1. Let me just take a moment and wait just for a second till you turn there. I want us to all be on the same page. Thank you, Troy. Thank you, Jerry. Abram, thank you. All right, let's consider the word of God together. Romans chapter 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? Verse 2. May it never be. How shall we who die to sin still live in it? That's where we'll stop today. On a Sunday evening at the close of a service at Westminster Chapel in 1943, a well-known preacher came into the vestry that evening and said to the famous Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, When are you going to preach? an expositional series of messages from the book of Romans. And the very wise doctor said, when I have understood Romans 6. Romans chapter 6 is perhaps the most difficult chapter to understand. Out of the 16 chapters in Romans, chapter 6 is is the most difficult to grasp. However, remember this. Those passages that are often the most difficult to understand are also the most important to understand. But they're also the most glorious to behold. We will not seek to exegete every verse in this chapter, but rather our aim this morning will be to pick up a few of the strands of truth, the main strands of truth in the Apostles' argument, and then seek to examine them carefully. Once we have wrapped our minds around the main point of the text or the chapter, then we're going to make personal application. Now, much of what Paul says in this chapter flows naturally from what he has said in chapter 5, having introduced and contrasted and compared Adam and Christ, Paul now seeks to answer the question, what does this mean for us? If you are united to Christ, what difference does it make? If you have been joined to him, how does it affect your life? How does it affect your perspective? How does it it affect your commitments? How does it affect your priorities? What principles emerge that must be practiced? That's what we're going to discover in this text. Now, there are, there are two main images in this chapter. And I want to try to give you those two images because if you understand the images, then you can understand the text. One of the images that Paul speaks of is in verses 3 through 5, and it's the image of baptism. The second image is pretty powerful. Baptism is powerful, yes, but there's another image in this chapter that we need to get a hold of because we will spend the majority of the time on this image. And it is the image of a slave and a master. A slave and a master. Now, let me um, help your thinking by telling you a story. Stuart 
Olyot tells this story. He says there was once a, a poor slave who was kept as a prisoner in a castle of his tyrannical master. The slave had to do all that his cruel master commanded and he became more and more miserable because the tyrant exploited him. Sometimes he tried to escape by leaning a ladder with ten rungs against the wall to escape, but he could never get very far up the ladder before his master appeared and snatched him off and beat him nearly half to death. There seemed to be no way of getting away from the bondage and the suffering. It so happened that nearby there lived a great king who, out of love for this poor prisoner, planned a marvelous way to release him. We need not go into the details except to say that the king killed the imprisoned slave and made a way for him to find new life. He tells the story. He goes on to say that the tyrant came looking for his slave and found him dead. And this meant to his annoyance that he could not make any more demands on his life. None of the rights which he previously exercised over the slave could operate anymore. The master-slave relationship that existed for so long was now at a permanent end. When the slave's body was buried, the great king came along and raised him from the dead and took him to his own home. The slave was overcome with thankfulness for the fact that he had been delivered from his condition in such a remarkable way. He was so overjoyed that he found himself in the home of someone so wise, so gracious, and so powerful. His heart was filled with sincere love and affection for his deliverer. He was determined that he would now serve his new king. The old relationship that had been there before was ended by death, and yet he was alive. He recognized that having been given such a newness of life, there was only one that he could serve, and he was dead to the old master and alive to his new one. Now, if you tracked with that story, in any shape, form, or fashion, it is really the chief point of this entire chapter. Let me show you. In this text, in verses 1 through 14, the first picture is given, and it is a picture of a killed and resurrected slave. Then in verses 15 through the end of the chapter, he gives a second picture, and it's a picture of a visit to a marketplace where now that slave goes to the marketplace and he hears the old master call out for him, but also the new master. And he has to make a choice now. Which one will he obey? Will he obey the old master? Or will he continue to follow his new master? That's the picture, and the truths are simple. What Paul wants to teach us in this text is this. There are only two masters. Sin and God. Only two masters, and these two masters pay two wages. One is death, the other is life. What Paul wants to teach us here is that for a Christian to go back to an old master called sin is so preposterous. It would be like an emancipated slave remaining in bondage to his old master. It makes no sense. He's going to take that same idea in chapter 7 and say it would be like a widow who is remaining subject to the laws of her dead husband. That's what he teaches in chapter 7. 
And so as we come to this text, get the image in your mind. There is a killed and resurrected slave. And now that slave has to make a choice between the old master and the new master. And he wouldn't think about going back to the old master because he's been raised to new life by a new king. Now, James Stewart, one of the um, great theologians of the 19th century, in his classic book entitled, A Man in Christ, said this. He said, with magnificent vigor and effort, Paul drives home to the heart and conscience of the listeners this lesson. And it is this. That to be united with Jesus in death means that the believer has made a complete and drastic break with sin. This is what we're going to seek to develop in this chapter. Now again, let me just give you a couple other points by way of uh, outlining in your Bible so that you might see where we're going. You could divide this chapter into two halves. Uh, The first half, again, is in verses 1 through 14. The second half is in verses 15 through 23. So write somewhere in your Bible this point. In the first half of this chapter, we discover how grace unites us to Christ. How grace unites us to Jesus. In the second half of this chapter, which is 15 through 23... We discover how grace initiates us into a new slavery. Into a new slavery. Let me repeat those so, you, so that we, we can make sure that you have them. First, grace unites us to Christ. Secondly, grace initiates us into a new slavery. Now, there are, there are two questions that are asked in this chapter, and they both need to be understood to catch the flow of Paul's argument. The first question we find in the very first verse. The second question we find in the 15th verse. So let your eyes drop to the page, to the Bible, and notice these two questions. The first question, verse 1. What shall we say then? Are we to continue... In sin, so that grace may increase. Uh, Eugene Peterson translates this. uh, So what shall we do? Keep on sinning so God can keep on forgiving? Um, We need to answer that question and be clear about it. The second question is in verse 15. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? Answer, may it never be. In the first question, what, what Paul is posing here, in essence, says this. If, if grace abounds where sin increases, then should, should I sin all the more so that I may receive all the more grace? Ladies and gentlemen, this, is a, this was the perverted teaching of the infamous Rasputin who was a religious advisor to the Romanov family in Russia in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. This uh, false teacher taught that if you sin more, then God will give you more grace. And if you sin with more abandon, then God will give you more opportunity to glorify himself. He actually taught that if you are simply an ordinary sinner, you're just going to get ordinary grace. So you need to try to be an extraordinary sinner so that you can receive extraordinary grace. Now, this was an absolute perversion truth. Absolute perversion. And Paul deals with that first question for us in this text. The second question, which is in verse 15 arose in part from those who imagined that in the gospel, God was teaching that justification did not involve sanctification. 
In other words, there were some who believed that as long as I believe, I can do as I please. Does that sound familiar? Yeah, we hear that kind of teaching today from unbelievers all around, from religious people all around, that, you know, as long as I believe, I can, I can do what I want. So Paul is going to deal with these two questions. Now, I want to uh, labor with you, not only in this text, but work from behind the scenes here, because the, these are very important questions. Very important questions. And um, before we jump to question number one, I want to explain something. The Bible reveals that justification, which means that you are declared righteous, it is a legal standing before God, that justification and sanctification, which means to be set apart, or to be holy, they are to be differentiated. Okay, the Bible teaches that they are to be differentiated, but we must not separate them. They're like two sides of one coin. There's an inseparable connection between justification and sanctification as salvation components. But come up close and listen. We need to make the distinction between new life in Christ and living that life in holiness. However, if we make justification dependent on sanctification, then we take away the freeness of justification. We must understand that we cannot make sanctification or justification dependent on sanctification or we rob the gospel of its freeness and what we do is we add works to grace now I need to go on to say this that justification and to claim that you've been justified without practical And personal righteousness is actually to turn the grace of God into a license to sin. Do you hear what I said? If you say, I can be justified, but I don't have to be holy. I don't need to live holy. Then what you're doing is you're taking God's grace and you're trying to make it into a license to sin. The Bible teaches very clearly that they are distinct Yet they must not be separated. Because when justification happens in heaven for the sinner, sanctification and regeneration takes place on earth in our lives. We must be clear about that matter. Now let's, uh, let's deal with two questions from our text. And, and, I'll, and I'll try not to make this uh, uh, too heavy, but these are important questions. Question number one. Are you dead to sin? Have you died to sin? Paul puts it this way in verse 1. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may increase? Verse 2, may it never be. How How shall we who die to sin still live in it? So here's the question. What does it mean? To be dead to sin. Legitimate question? Come on now, track with me. If I've lost you, gather back your thoughts and focus in once again. What does it mean to be dead to sin? Let me tell you what it does not mean first, and then I'll tell you what it means. Being dead to sin does not mean that believers are unresponsive to temptation. It doesn't mean that we're unresponsive to temptation as a corpse is to physical touch. Now, if we go down to the morgue down there and and, and they allow us in for some reason and there's a dead body, we can touch that body and that body won't respond. Believers are not like that when it comes to temptation. 
We're not. So it doesn't mean that we're unresponsive to temptation. We are still tempted, and sometimes we respond to that temptation. Being dead to sin does not mean that believers are dead to the appeal and the power of sin. Listen, there is still an attraction towards sin in our flesh. Come on now, can I get any witnesses in here? Now, if you sit here today and you say, I'm saved, but, but you know what? Uh, I'm never tempted. You're just lying and you're not being truthful. There is still a temptation that we face and there is still an appeal to sin in our flesh. When you were converted, God gave you a new heart, but he did not convert your flesh. Your flesh is still as fallen and powerful as it was before you got saved. He didn't change it. He just did something else. And I'll explain in just a moment. So being dead to sin does not mean that we're unresponsive to temptation. It does not mean that believers are dead to the appeal and the power of sin. But let me tell you one more thing. That being dead to sin does not mean that believers are dead, and this is going to throw you now, that we are dead to the love of sin. See, this is where we, we often get tripped up. There's something in our flesh that loves sin. Now, in your spirit, something else has taken place. You're a new creature in Christ, and you don't love it. You're miserable with it. But in your flesh, there's something in your flesh and in my flesh that loves sin, that enjoys sin. I often give the illustration, you know, I don't like chitlins. Now, some of you say, what are you talking about, chitlins? Uh, I don't have time to explain. Uh, Some people do. Some people like chitlins, you know, it's pig intestines and they kind of, they make it right. Some people really love it. Give them some hot sauce and cornbread and, you know, they go at it. But, you know, you can put a big plate of chitlins in my face. It has no appeal to me whatsoever. Sweet potato pie is another thing. Yeah. Ah, there you go. Now, listen, there is something in our flesh That is tainted. Sin is housed in our flesh. And because our flesh is unregenerate, we still have the propensity not only to move towards sin, but that if we feed that sin, we can grow to love that sin in our flesh, although our spirit is absolutely miserable. We call it being in bondage. We call it having a stronghold in one's life. Now, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, don't turn there, but just write down the reference. Jesus said, no man can serve two masters. For he he will either hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. And when Jesus made that statement in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, he he was not teaching that Christians can't be lured into sin. He wasn't teaching that Christians can't be enticed by sin to the point that they even might be enslaved. He wasn't teaching that. He was simply saying, you can't love God and sin at the same time. You can't love sin and God at the same time. You're going to love either God or love sin, but you can't do them both at the same time. Now, what does it mean then? That we are dead to sin. We must understand that when the Bible speaks of death, death is represented in Scripture more in legal terms than in physical terms. And so when we think of death, we need to keep in mind that death is looked at in Scripture, and especially in this context, as a realm, as a state, as a sphere in which people live. 
Jesus spoke of us being delivered from death to life, from one sphere to another. We have been transferred, Paul says in Colossians, from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. And that's the concept that we need to keep in mind when we think of this issue of death, that we're speaking of a sphere, a realm, a state. But this is what Paul wants us to know. that When he talks about being dead to sin, what he is saying is that something has happened in the believer's life that has changed forever how they relate to sin in practice. Something has changed forever. Paul is saying that because of the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, we have been freed from sin's dominion. That Christians may sin, but now sinning is out of character for us. That Christians may sin, but it's actually a declension from the norm. It's not our habitual practice. We feel out of sorts when we do because something has taken place in our lives. Can I get a witness here? You see, what Paul is doing is Paul is inviting the readers to reflect on what it means to become a Christian. What it means to become a Christian is not to get kind of a new motor in an old car. But to become a Christian means to become an entirely new creature in Christ. It's to lose this, this commitment and this love for the old in the new because you are a new person. And now sin is like an intrusion. Sin is, it makes you miserable. Although the flesh loves it, you in the inner part, you you never can get comfortable with it. You never can. What Paul wants us to understand is that we now have a new master. And now we can say no to the old master. You see, before, all we said was yes. That's all we knew. Sin said, come. We said, okay. We, we did what we wanted, when we wanted, how we wanted. But when you become a Christian, when your heart has changed, when you, when you meet Jesus and you're united to Christ, now all of a sudden sin calls and you, you, you don't want to go. The flesh may say, you remember, but the new man says, I don't want any part of that. And you can say no. Can I get a witness here? So what we, Paul wants us to understand is he wants us to reflect on the fact that we were slaves. We were killed and then raised to life. But now we have to live in the marketplace. And that old master comes calling. We don't want to live with that old master. We have a new king. So... The question you must ask for yourself is this. Are you dead to sin? Have you died to sin? Have you died to sin? Can you go back to that old realm and just feel at home? Can you go back to that old master and that old state and that old, that old realm and just feel like you really never lost a beat? If so, you've never been born again. You've never been born again. Now, the second question is even more pointed. And it's the question, what do you live for? What do you live for? Now, don't let this one escape you. Because the Bible teaches us in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, that before conversion, we were dead in sin. We were in a state of sin. We were in a state of rebellion toward God. But when salvation came in Jesus Christ, then we were made alive with Christ. It's a very important phrase. And Now the apostle wants to explain that since this is true, the result will be that you will be dead to sin. You will be dead to sin because you have 
received a new identity. A new identity. Let me give you a practical um, lesson here at this point. What Paul wants us to understand is that when a person becomes a true believer, their identity is changed once and for all and forever. And the key to living a holy life is remembering who you are. Did you hear me? The key to to living a sanctified life is to remember who you are. When you remember that I belong to Christ, I'm a new creature, then that's the key to living a life of holiness. Some people think, you know what, I'm just going to start living right and then I'll be right. No, first of all, you need to be right and then you live right. We get it reversed. We get it all mixed up. And the Apostle Paul wants us to understand that a believer cannot live in sin. There's no way. These are actually two questions that unbelievers ask. No regenerated person asks these questions. No regenerated person asks, can I continue in sin that grace may increase? No saved person asks, well, shall I sin because I'm, I'm not under the law but under grace? No saved person asks that. None. How can we live in two realms? We cannot. We cannot live in the realm of death and the realm of life. It's impossible. Death and life cannot coexist. Either you have life or you're dead. Either you're saved or you're unsaved. Either you're a child of God or a child of the devil. But you cannot be in between. You cannot be in between. Now, in the rest of this text, Paul is going to explain to us how we have died to sin. Namely, through a spiritual baptism, and namely by being united to Christ. And we'll consider those lessons in the exposition in the days to come. At this point, I want to talk practically with you now about what does this mean for us. And so I want, to, I want you to close your Bible, which is always a scary thing for a preacher to say. <laughs> you know, a preacher should always preach with his finger on the text. But I want you to close your Bible because I want you to just think with me for a second, okay? But it's going to be out of what I've shared with you. I want to ask you some questions. And now it's examination time. So I want you to think. Don't think about these questions for someone else. Think about them for you. Okay? First question. Are you an antinomian? You say, why why do you throw that term out there? It, It simply means those who are against the law. They are against the law of God. They think that, you know, they don't need the law of God at all because they have grace. Because I have grace, I don't really need God's law. Are you an antinomian? If you are, then you must repent. Because you must understand that good works are a command for Christians to obey. And they flow from your conversion, but they don't count as your justification. Believers must exhibit good works. They must reflect those. And if good works are not there, it proves that faith is not there either. Now, understand, works don't give you salvation. Jesus Christ gives you salvation, right? We're saved by grace through faith. It's not of ourselves. It's a gift from God. But again, if you don't have good works in your life, you are not a Christian. And you have never been redeemed. You have never been born again. You've really never trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. So you must ask, am I an antinomian? Do I just think, well, yes, I believe in grace, but I don't believe in God's law, his command. If so, repent. Let me take it a little further with you. Second question. 
Ask yourself, do the commandments of God bind my conscience? Do the commandments of God bind my conscience? In other words, am I, am I really concerned with God's law? Are you? Now, Matthew 22, don't turn there, but Matthew 22, Jesus said that the greatest command was to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And the second is like unto it to love your neighbor as yourself. One of the ways that you understand that you are a Christian is that you are concerned with God's highest commandment, which is to love him, to love him with everything in you. And you're also concerned about the Great Commission, where he said, go and make disciples of all the nations. But does it bind your conscience? Does the commandments of God cause you concern where you want, where you see where you fall short and you want to obey him because not to earn his favor, but to please your father? Is that a desire for you? Do you know God is concerned with how you feel about him? God is concerned with how you think about him. Even now as you sit in a service like this, are you loving God with your mind? Are you loving God with your will? The next question is this. Have you ever made light of your sin because of the grace given to you? By Christ. Have you ever thought, you know, I know this is sin, but, you know, I know Jesus saves. You've made light of your sin because of the grace given to you by the Lord. true Christian when they do that they repent right away because they know that even the smallest of sins is offensive to God right we know it and sometimes we do make light of our sin but the spirit of God convicts us right away have you died to sin next question have you died to sin Have you really been transferred to a different realm? One way that you can know that you've died to sin is to just ask yourself this question. What's my attitude toward sin? What's my attitude toward it? Am I kind of like friendly with sin? Am I okay with it? Am I friends with little white Small sins and kind of, I don't like the big ones, but the little ones, you know, I can tolerate. What's your attitude towards sin? Next question. Have you begun to hate sin? Have you begun to hate sin? If you've never begun to hate it, you've never begun to love Jesus and to know him. For it is sin it was for sin that Jesus came to this earth and died on a cross. And no, no true believer can be friends with sin who knows the forgiveness of the Savior. Next question. Are you befriending 
sin more than turning from it. I'm trying to ask, get you to examine yourself. I'm not talking about just the overt, blatant sins which cause harm to people, but I'm talking about those inward sins of the Spirit. Sins of pride. Sins of murmuring and complaining. Sins in the thought world. For you may never do it, but you think it. And does it bother you when you think it? This is one of the wonderful and great truths of the word of God. And that is that sin is not just something that we commit in action, but we commit it in desire and in thought. And that's why we need to be redeemed at the very core part of our nature. God saves and redeems even in the inward part. What is your attitude toward the nature of sin? But here's the last question. The last question that I want to pose to you before we take the Lord's Supper. And it's this. Have you lost your joy? You know, once a person has tasted the joy of being united to Jesus Christ, they will never, ever be satisfied with anything less. Never. But see, losing your joy doesn't mean you're not a Christian. Because remember, David lost his joy because he was in sin. But what did he do? He repented of his sin. And he asked God to restore to him the joy of his salvation. And if you're honest, some of you, you've been coming, you've been committed, you've been carrying your Bible and giving, but yet, truth of the matter is, you've lost your joy. You've lost your joy. And this is what you need to know, and I want to end on this note. The diminishing of joy in the believer's life is one of the strongest cords to pull you back to Jesus. Because you know that only his joy satisfies. So the question is, what will you do? How will you respond? I'd like you to be like David. Acknowledge your sin and cry out for cleansing. Cry out for restoration. Ask God to restore to you the joy of your salvation. Have you died to sin? And who do you live for? The believer lives for Christ. Let us pray together. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. One of the purposes of the Lord's Supper is to give God's people an opportunity to deal with their sin God's way before God deals with us with strong discipline. God is so gracious to give us the Lord's Supper to remind us of what Christ has done for us, to remind us of this covenant that has been made. And so don't look at this as a as so much of a threatening thing, as much as the gracious actions of a father who's calling his children to be who he has created them to be. But make no mistake about it, the father doesn't want anyone playing at the table. 
Make no mistake about it, that even as his child, if you play at the table by looking at sin in a very casual way, if you play at the table, if you come to the table and you're not serious about doing business with God, he will deal with you as his child. And so don't don't despise the word of God. Come today, dear Christian brother and sister. Confess your sin to God. Tell the Lord all about it. Perhaps you're here today and you've never been transferred from the realm of death to the realm of life and for some odd reason you are sensing deep in your soul that you need to come to Jesus. You you need to respond to him. Well you can do that too. Call out to him. Ask him to rescue you, to forgive you, to cleanse you, and to make you a new person. Father, we thank you for dealing with us at this very serious point. In some regards, Father, we've become very casual with sin. And we understand now that it's really not us, it's our flesh, and yet we hate it still. We desire to walk with you in holiness and in truth. Your word says that if any man can, if we confess our sins, that you are faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord, we know that that old master will come calling again and again. But we don't have to say yes, we can say no. We say yes to you. Yes, Lord, yes, to your will and to your way. We ask that you would give us this grace to get up if we have fallen down. We thank you for that mercy. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said,